This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. I appreciate it. Every single one of you for showing up. It gives me tremendous chizuk. The people actually care what I have to say. <laughs> so now that you're here, you're stuck. So you might as well listen. This year was your nishmat. Gittel devora bat dov ber. The nishmat meir ben batsham ai. The nishmat all... Or Shraga. Or Shraga. Any Nishpat, my grandfather, Yosef ben Avraham, and my nephew who just passed away, unfortunately, Yaakov ben Tamar Malka. He is a Chambaruch. The Fuat Yafa bat Sultan. The Fuat Yafa bat Sultan. Sultan. And the Fuat Shlemama? Rachman. Rachman? Ben Lea. Ben Lea. Amen. Amen. I want to thank the host of the Shear on West Orange over here. Still a weird name for a city. I'm still going to tell you straight up. But it's a refreshing name also. So thank you for the host, Joey Hakoen Rosa Zadeh. Rosa Zadeh. Joey. I like Joey. Gamani Palsi. Hashem. Thank you so much for hosting this. This should give you tremendous zechuyot. Hashem should give you only bracha, health, nachat from your children, ad man ve'esrim shana. Okay, Rabotai, let's discuss a few mishnayot and perkei avot. I'm sure you guys all heard of this mishnah. But it's a tremendous, powerful mishnah to chaza to go over. Rabbi Yaakov Omer, Ha'olam hazeh domeh Liprosdol, this world is compared to a hallway. Bipnei ha'olam haba, compared to the next world. Hatken atzmecha b'prosdol, fix yourself up while you're in the hallway. Kedei shetikenes latarklin, in order for you to enter olam haba. The Mishnah here states the obvious. This world that we're living right now is extremely uh-huh. short. There's so much to accomplish, so much Torah and mitzvot, so much wealth to acquire while we're alive. But says the Zohar, every human, Keshi'uchai, while he's alive, he or she thinks they're here forever. Every person, while he's alive, day to day, thinks he's here forever. Says the Zohar, our avodah, our job, is to make sure to call the bluff and say, no, 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 remind yourself, life is short. And there's a lot, a lot to accomplish. A person might think in this world, you know, I have such a long time to live, there's so much Torah and Mitzvot to accomplish, but I have time. When a person knows the value of Torah and Mitzvot, and how much she can accomplish, or she can accomplish in this world, that's when they recognize life is short. When you know how much you can accomplish, then a person starts thinking to himself, wow, you know what? Life is shorter than I think. You know the famous line? Time flies when you're having fun. Why does time fly when you have fun? Because the fun is so fun that the, the fun outnumbers the time. There's not enough time to have so much fun. When a person understands the value of mitzvot, and how much mitzvot there is to accomplish, that's when they recognize and they chah as it's in Yiddish they understand how life short is I want to share with you a mashal sorry for all the people in the back I want to share with you a mashal from the Chafetz Chaim he writes like this he says imagine you had a king this is a beautiful beautiful parable please try to listen says the Chafetz Chaim imagine you had a king who told his country his Medina whoever succeeds to make peace between my nation and my neighbor nation, the nation next to me, because we had an argument, whoever is able to make truce, peace, shalom, will be able to come to my treasure and my palace that's full of gold and wealth. And for two hours, he can come with as many bags as he wants, as many huge garbage bags as he wants. He's able to collect as much gold as possible. Only whoever is able to make peace between me and my neighbor. There was one citizen, Abatai, that was able to do it. He pulled it off. He was Matsliach. He was able to make peace. The impossible, he did it. So the king tells him, Aha, Zachita, you won? Now I'm going to give you a date where you can come to the palace and for two hours grab as much gold as you want. He gives him a date. Let's say you're going to come January 22nd. Okay. This citizen is excited. I have a chance to go inside the palace of the king and grab as much gold as I want. 
and him and his family are already preparing what they're going to do with the money, what house they're going to buy, where they're going to move to, what are they going to do with the money, where are they going to invest. This guy got himself a top suit for the day. He got a haircut. Everything is good. The guy is neat. His family, everyone is ready. His family, his grandparents, his uncles, his aunts, his cousins are all walking him. Comes the big day, January 22nd. They're all walking him to the palace. They can't wait for him to leave with a sack full of gold. He goes inside the palace. The man is excited to grab as much gold as possible. He goes in. Now, the king is not a fool. The king is a smart man. He's going to try to avoid this guy to grab as much gold as possible because the king wants the wealth for himself. So what does the king do? He hires the best musicians in the country. The best musicians. The guy walks in. Here comes the violin, beautiful violin. I'm in love with the violin. And then here comes the best guitar guy. And then comes the drums guy. And the guys listen to the music. Ah, is a naim. You know when you listen to good, good music, it's so relaxing, so enjoyable. And the guys listen to the music. And he says, in another five minutes, I'll go grab the gold. For now, let me enjoy the music. And he's listening to the music. And he's humming away. And he's relaxing. Okay, time to move on. As he goes towards the gold, what does he see? He sees the top chef of the country. These guys with the white hats ch- 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 cutting chicken and salad and, guys, and it smells so good and he says, okay, let me just taste I just want to taste some food he goes and he tastes this food, this chicken raw meat, not raw meat, well done, not well done this steak, that steak, this sauce that salad, and he enjoys himself he says, okay, now let me go grab the gold. As he's going towards the gold, suddenly he sees beautiful pieces of art, beautiful, gorgeous paintings, gorgeous, and he sees one piece of art, another one, he says, wow, look at that one this is even nice and he keeps on walking and he says okay now I can go grab the gold as he's turning towards the gold then suddenly wow he sees a beautiful garden oh but here we go again beautiful flowers beautiful waterfall and then the trees everything is so beautiful the king made sure everything is top notch by the time he realizes that he has to grab the gold the guard of the king says, Alo, alo, alo. All you have is 20 minutes left, 10 minutes left. The guy tells himself, Why? Where did everything go? Where did the time go? I had two hours. He got distracted, but all the beautiful and fun things, all he has is 10, 20 minutes left. He runs, he tries to grab as much as possible, but barely one sack of gold was enough to grab in 20 minutes. He walks out of the palace, ay, ay, ay. The family, especially the wife, tells him, where is all the money? I was planning on buying the most expensive clothing and everything. What's going on with you? The guy got distracted by the music. He got distracted by food, entertainment, gardens. He got distracted. And he had the opportunity to grab gold as much as possible. Says the Chafetz Chaim, we're in this world. And Hashem gives us opportunities to grab bags, load of Torah and mitzvot to come to Olam with. The Chafetz Chaim says, within one minute, usually a person can say around 200 words. That's what the Chafetz Chaim writes in his Sefer Torah Tabayit. Try to calculate it. 200 words in one minute. And we know the Mishnah tells us one word of Torah, one mitzvah of Torah, is keneged kulam, is bigger than all the mitzvot. So make the calculation. A person learns Torah for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, one hour worth of Torah. Do you know how much wealth, how much Torah I mean, such you just accomplished? And that's in this world. And the Gemara tells us in Brachot, the Gemara says, how are ladies zochet olam haba? That's what the Gemara asks. How do ladies get olam haba? So the Gemara says one of the reasons is when they make sure and they let their husbands and their children go learn Torah. It's not easy when the husband comes back home from work and then he tells his wife, no, I'm going to class, I'm going to learn Torah. The wife wants the husband home and finally he's home. No, now he's going to learn Torah. But when the wife gives up her time and gives herself up for a husband to go learn Torah, that is her zechut, says the Gemara and Brachot. That will be her merit to go to Olam Abba. One of the greatest rabbis that we have was Chacha bin Tzion Abba Shaul. He was the Rosh Yeshiva of Porat Yosef. And he was the Chavutah of Chacham Vadia. When his wife passed away, he said by her levaya, by her funeral, that she has a bigger Olam Abba than him. Why? Because he made the calculation. If she gets 50% of my learning, and he learned a lot, and then she gets 50% of my son's learning, because she got 50% of her son, that means she has a bigger Olam Abba. Because I get rewarded for my learning only. She gets rewarded for my learning and my son. That's what he said by her funeral. Ladies get Olam Abba when they let their husbands and men learn Torah. They get Olam Abba for other reasons too. But the main thing is when they help Limud the Torah. There's so much opportunities and gold to grab in this world. But a person can get distracted. 
Another year goes by. Another year goes by. One year a person gets distracted by sports. Another year it could be this. Another year it could be that. And meanwhile, life is getting shorter and shorter and so much Torah and mitzvah to accomplish. And that's what the Mishnah is saying. This world is compared to a hallway. Before the next world. For those who took the subway in Manhattan, I hate it. I can't stand it. But when I used to take the subway, it's a very uncomfortable place. The chairs are uncomfortable. The whole thing is just not comfortable. I never saw a guy yet, now New York is different, but I never saw a guy walk into the subway with a microwave or with a couch, you know, with a safe or with a refrigerator. Why not? Because everybody knows the subway is only a short ride. Or let's say in Israel, when you take the autobus, it's very uncomfortable. The buses there are very bumpy. When you go from Benerbach to Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim to Benerbach, it's a very bumpy ride, but people do it. How do they do it? Because they know all it is is a bus ride. How does the person use a subway, even though it's uncomfortable? The person knows it's only, a, it's only one ride away to the destination. I'm not living in the subway. I'm not living on the bus. It's only a short ride. This world, Olam Azir, that we're in right now, Rabatai, is a bus ride. It's just one route, direct one way to go to Olam Abba. When a person understands that this world is short, and it's a bus ride to Olam Abba, then even when things get bumpy, even when something can be uncomfortable, or a person is going through a hard time, it reduces the pain when you know you're here for a short while. Not only does it reduce the pain, but when you know what you're in this world for, you make sure to grab more Torah and more mitzvot, more gold, more opportunities. There's so much mitzvot to accomplish. And the Gemara tells us in Ketubot, remind me to go back. The Gemara tells us in Ketubot like this Rabbeinu Akadosh, one of the main rabbis we had in the Gemara. Rabbeinu Akadosh. The Gemara tells us that on Friday night, he will, after he passed away, on Friday night he will leave Olam Abba, to come to Shabbat in this world, to this world to keep Shabbat, and he will say Kiddush to his family. So the Ben Yishchai asked in the spa, Rabbeinu HaKadosh, you're one of the biggest rabbis that we had at all times. You're already in Olam Abba. Can you imagine how big your Olam Abba is? Why would you want to leave Olam Abba to come to this world? You're already in Olam Abba. Why would the Gemara, why would the Talmud tell us that Rabbeinu HaKadosh leaves the next world, leaves Olam Abba, to come to this world just to keep another Shabbat? For what? You already reached your destination of Alam Abba. Why would he do that? Says the Ben Ishchai, from here we learn a tremendous lesson. As great as Alam Abba is, and there's nothing greater than the next world, this world is the only world where you can take action and actually grab Torah Mitzvah. This world is Olam Asiya. It's a world of doing. It's a world of accomplishing. So Rabbi HaKadosh, although he loved Olam Abba, but he still missed a little bit this world when it comes to grabbing Torah Mitzvah. This world is so sweet. There's so much to accomplish. It's so much fun. There's so much action of Torah Mitzvah to grab that even the biggest rabbi felt, for Shabbat, I want to come back to this world. I want to keep another Shabbat. That's how powerful mitzvot are in this world. That's how awesome olam azeh is when a person understands, whoa, there's so much I can accomplish. And whatever I build in this world, I will not be able to do in the next world. It's either now or never. Like the Gemara says, whoever cooks an Erev Shabbat will eat on Shabbat. Whoever doesn't cook before Shabbat will not be able to eat on Shabbat, which means it's a saying. On Shabbat, come Saturday, one is not allowed to cook. One is not allowed to warm up most foods. So that's a person that did not cook before Shabbat. What is it getting in the Shabbat? Only cold food in the fridge. But a person who prepares for Shabbat before Shabbat comes, and they make good food, comes Shabbat, they have good food. Says the Gemara, this world, a person has to prepare for the next world. You can't just cruise yourself into Olam Abba. A person has to prepare. And how do you prepare? More mitzvot and more mitzvot. Doing the right thing. More Torah and more Torah. A person prepares when he reaches Olam Abba. Finally, he can enjoy. He can enjoy his work. The food that he cooked. You know, the Gaul Mavina. I'm going to say it over even though I wasn't planning on it. The Gaul Mavina is just very scary. Okay, I'm going to tell you one scary thing tonight. The Gaul Mavina writes like this. He says, after 120... When a person passes away, one of the greatest pain that's going to be for that person is when he or she is going to look at the loss of potential that they had in this world. One of the greatest yesuim, the pain, the shame that a person is going to have when he's going to see the loss potential, the loss potential that they were able to grab in this world and wasn't taken for the opportunity while they were alive. He said it's going to be one of the greatest Yisuim after 120 minutes a person passes away. It's an unbelievable thing. Life is short. 
Life, there's a lot of Torah mitzvot to accomplish. When? When a person's headlights are on, when the flashlight is on and life is clear in front of him. You're here to grab more Torah and more mitzvot. The more a person recognizes what he's here for and how much Torah is valuable to build his olam haba, the more a person recognizes, wow, life is shorter than I thought. There's so much to do. So many things, you know, the Gaul Mavina before he passed away, he would, they said that he was holding his pair of tzitzit. And we know tzitzit is a mitzvah at every moment. He was holding his pair of tzitzit, crying, tearing. And he said, look at this, in this world, I'm about to leave this world. In this world, look how much I can accomplish by just wearing a piece of clothing. Tzitzit, I'm wearing a piece of clothing. And I'm getting so much reward for Allah Maba. And he was crying, I don't want to leave this world because I want to accomplish more and more and more. That's when she appreciated the mitzvot. You know, Chacham of Adi Yosef, in 2006, he had to, remind me to go back, please. In 2006, he had to go through a back surgery. His back was hurting him tremendously. Okay, But the doctors told him that we have to put you on anesthesia, and because you're very, very old, and in your condition, it can mean death. So you're taking a very big gamble. So they said, you want to discuss it with your family. So Chacham and his sons were there. And Chacham told them, I want to take the surgery. And they told him, Abba, but daddy, you know, you can die from this. Just be on painkillers, we'll make it work. You don't want to take a chance of death. So Chacham Yosef told him, he said, listen, with my back pains, it's so painful, I can't learn properly. I just can't learn. I can't bend my back. I'm not going to be able to learn properly. And if I'm not going to be able to learn properly, if there's going to be no more learning to offer me, Chacham Yosef said, why live? then what's the point of living? I want to learn Torah. I want to learn more Torah and more mitzvot. If I see that I can't learn Torah anymore, I don't see another point to live. You know what that means, Rabotai? That means Chacham Ovadia. When it came to Torah and mitzvot in this world, that was it. That was his priority. He's living for Torah. He's living for Torah and mitzvot. He understood the value. So if I can't learn Torah anymore, he told himself, so why am I here for? What's the point of what, what, what am I doing here? His vision his whole life was more Torah, more Torah, more wealth, more wealth. You know, I had a friend in Yeshiva, we were Chavutot. And this guy told me that he, do, he doesn't understand uh, many people want to be millionaires, millionaires. That's what he used to talk. Okay, right now he's a multimillionaire. This guy, my friend. How did it happen? Somebody offered him a job in the city. And once he was working in Manhattan in the city, Baruch Hashem, his friends hooked him up over there in real estate. And then you recognize, whoa, there's so much money, there's so much money to make. You know, when your friends hook you up and you're good at it, a person recognizes his eyes open up, his, his tava, his desires to grab money get bigger because he sees how much he can accomplish. And then suddenly he's grabbing more money and more money and he's running and he's running. The guy's running around all day. He became a multimillionaire. So last time we went, I asked him what happened. Remember in Yeshiva, he told me, you never want to be a millionaire. Uh, he tells me, Yaakov, you don't understand. I said that in Yeshiva, when I didn't recognize how much money you can make. But once you start working in the city, and you see how much money your friends are making, how you can do it too, even better than them, how can you see the potential of making money and not make the money? And he's right for that. He went and made a lot of money. How much more so, Rabbi when somebody recognizes the potential of Torah and mitzvot and spirituality in this world. When one recognizes, one develops the taste of Torah and mitzvot and understands how much you can accomplish in this world and what's really valuable that Torah and mitzvot, when one reaches that level, why? Wow, they're never going to stop. They're going to keep on going. More Torah, more mitzvot, more Torah, more mitzvot. They say over a story with Chacham Avadi Yosef when he came to Brooklyn once. He stayed up the whole Friday night learning in Rabbi Ozeri's house, the rabbi in Brooklyn. Chacham Avadi stayed up the whole Friday night. So they asked so Rabbi Ozeri asked Chacham Ovedia's wife, when she came at the time, it was in the 90s, he asked her, how does your husband stay up the whole night learning? Can you imagine learning the whole night? And only Shavuot or Rabba. The whole night learning, learning. So she told him, the Ba'ali to my husband, it's like counting $100 bills cash. You know, imagine I give you a stack of $100 bills cash. Nobody gets bored of counting the $100. Tick, 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 $100, like guess you fly through the cash. Chacham Ovedia understood Torah Mitzvot's value is worth so much. To him, he can't stop. He just can't stop. More more Torah, more mitzvot, more Torah, more mitzvot. This is a person that developed a taste for Torah. So he's in the rat race of Torah and mitzvot. Not in the rat race of wealth, of money. In the rat race of more Torah, more mitzvot. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Once a person understands the value, then he understands how life is short and there's so much to accomplish. So much Torah and mitzvot. When a person knows that life is short, he will not get distracted by the music, by the entertainment like the Mashallah Chafetz Chaim. When you zoom, when you focus, when you know all you have is 
two hours to grab the gold from the palace of the king, then a person doesn't get distracted. A person has to remind himself again and again why I'm in this world. And that's what the Mishnah says. This world is compared to a hallway. You're only here for a short amount of time. Remember to prepare for Olam Abba. The Chafetz Chaim says another mashal. A lot of Chafetz Chaim today. He says one time he was walking in the streets of Raden, where he was from in Europe. And he saw, I said this mashal many times, and he saw a little girl playing with a doll in Buba. And as she was playing with the doll, it fell on the floor and it got dirty from the mud. And the little girl who was sitting on the floor in the street started crying, my doll, my doll, it got dirty, he started crying. The Chafetz Chaim told his Tamidim, imagine we take this doll away from this girl and we'll meet her in 20 years from now. On the same shana. And we're going to tell her, you see this doll? Like this? It's dead by now? Dirty? You cried over this. You cried over this doll falling on the floor. This older girl now, 20 year old, whatever, old 25, she's going to start laughing. <laughs> this is what you cry about, the doll, when the doll fell in the mud. Who cares about a doll? Says the Chafetz Chaim, in this world, people cry over nothing sometimes. You know, I used to have friends, when their team lost in sports, they really were start tearing. <laughs> What's going on over here? <laughs> they were start tearing. People cry over weird things. People fight over weird things. And Olam Abba, Hashem is going to show that person, this you cried over this? What did you do? Cry over the Bet HaMikdash. Cry over people not being religious yet. Cry over the loss of Jews passing away. Cry over Albanot and Yitumim, the orphans and the widows. That's what you cry about. You cry over these things. Or Hashem is going to show the person this you fought over. You fought over a parking spot. You fought over $500. This is what you're fighting about. What are you, what are you busy with? You're getting distracted. The focus is Torah mitzvot, Torah mitzvot. How beautiful it is to be a Jew. It's awesome. Thank you. Nice jacket. Thank you very much. You want it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe actually. Thank you. 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 How did I get to this? I don't even know how I got to this. How did I get to this? Oh, the Chavot Alevot says like this. This is a powerful Chavot Alevot. Beautiful. He writes, I used to have neighbors like that in New Jersey. Right now, I, I grew up in Lakewood, basically. Lakewood is very different. Now it's a very busy town. It's almost like Brooklyn. But back in the day, when we grew up in Lakewood, there was like one house in every block, two houses every block. So people had their gardens, and we used to own goats in Lakewood, believe it or not. Yeah, we used to own two. It was illegal. They took it away, but we used to own two goats. And then we used to have chickens. The chickens got so big. You know, one time my mother wanted to wake me up in the morning, and she put the chicken, the tanagot, right by my bed. So I wake up, I see like these blue, huge chicken eyes. Since then, I'm trying to have some chickens. I can't do kapalot. It's done. This whole thing is done. But we used to have all these things on Lakewood. Lakewood used to be a farm. And he used to have nice American neighbors who survived, who were in World War II and everything. And they were very into their gardens, very into the cars. They would spend hours on the wheels of the car, in the garden. Says the Chavot HaLevavot, very interesting humans, how humans work. Why is it that people will spend so much time building things with their own hands or creating things with their own hands? Sometimes it's cooking food, sometimes it's building a table, sometimes it's your car, sometimes it's your garden, or you want to write something up. Why is it that humans like to create, to build, lay at sale, to manufacture? He says human nature, Hashem made it. That the only other creation in the world, in this world, Hashem gave the humans that the only uh, Creations, only, um, how do you say it in English? Creature. Species, creatures. Creature sounds weird for a human, that's why. They're the only creatures that Hashem gave them the ability to create and build. Le'etzel. Every human being has this desire and this power in him that he wants or she wants to create and to build. The question is, what does that person use the desire for? There's many things a person can use it for. Some people use it for garden, for the cars, or some people use it, says the Chavot Levavot, and this is the hardest one. Some people use it to perfect themselves. Humans are not created perfect. Their job is to perfect themselves. A human's job in this world is to make themselves into a tzaddik, to make themselves into a good person. You know, sometimes you could be learning Musa with somebody, and that person will tell me, well, that's the way I am. I'm not saying that's the way you are. I also have my bad things. But me and you have to change. I mean, that's what we're in this world for, to become perfect people. Imagine you're the person that never speaks a shonara. Ah, how many people really like that exist? Never speak a shonara? How many humans do you know that are like that? I had one friend in yeshiva like that. 
never spoke a Shonara. And I just met him a couple of weeks ago. I, was, I remember in yeshiva, if you want to speak a Shonara, you got nervous next to him. You felt uncomfortable because you knew his guy doesn't speak a Shonara. This guy, no Shonara. I had friends that to this day don't have cell phones. And he learned Torah so much. Now he moved to Israel, to Kiyat Sefer. This guy in yeshiva used to calculate every moment of his day. Even in the bathroom, I remember him. Okay? When he would go use the bathroom, believe it or not, I know it sounds funny. The guy would have a timer in the bathroom. How much time did he spend in the bathroom to make sure to, to take the time back for Limuda Torah? This guy was very careful how much Torah was spent, how much waste, time did he waste, whatever he was doing. Imagine you're the person that 100% never lies. Can you imagine a life without lies? You know, there's a reason why Rabbeinu Yonah writes, if you want to take something upon yourself that's a game changer, that sounds easy, but it's the hardest, take upon yourself never to lie again in your life. Can you imagine that? One year straight, not one shekel, one lie. Says Rabbeinu Yonah, if a person is careful with no lies and trickeries and all these things, that will lead them to do so much to lie mitzvot. That's what Rabbeinu Yonah writes. It sounds like an easy thing. One year, no lie. There is a lot of room, and I'm talking to myself, big talker. There's a lot of room for a person to use his desire of building, of creating, of manufacturing, when it comes to themselves, to the person himself. Let me create a tzaddik. I want to be a righteous person. I want to be that perfect guy that Hashem is going to say, Ah! That's my son, that's my daughter. So if a person wants to build, says the Chavot Levavot, the first thing you should do is look yourself in the mirror and I'm talking to myself. Build yourself. Use your desires of building, of creating, of changing, of producing. Use it on yourself. You become that good person. There's so many things to change and to approve of. Every person has a desire to create. The question is, what does a person use it for? Can you imagine? So much potential could be lost. Let's talk about the iPhones for a second and all these things. How much potential is lost? It's an unbelievable, unbelievable thing. Besides that a person can fall for the sin of not watching their eyes. But how about the bitur Torah? The time that was that's spent on the phone is an unbelievable thing. That's lost potential. You're never going to find the person who's sitting on his deathbed after 120 in the hospital telling his wife or kids, Oh, I should have spent more time on YouTube. Oh, I should have spent more time on my phone. No. But you're going to find many who are going to say, ay, 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 I should have put my phone down and learned more Torah. More mitzvot, how much potential was lost? What did I do to myself? So much time, so much potential a person can lose by what? Just from these phones, just from the iPhones. But a person has to make sure, by the way, that's what they say. I went to a course for rabbis about all these different things. And they said the reason why social media is so bad for the teenagers, by the way, one of the reasons is because every human likes to create and produce. Social media gives this false feeling to the teenagers, like they start their own Instagram pages and their own TikTok pages, and then they have followers. So they, it gives them, the social media gives them the feeling as if they have something, as if there's something and they're not. So they feel as if they're creating, but they're really not creating. When it comes to the reality of life, they have nothing. Then they go, boom, rock bottom, they get depressed. It was a guy. His name was Thomas. That's the guy who said over by the speech. That's the damage of social media. It gives them the feeling that they're creating, but really nothing is happening. So a person has to make sure that he uses his kachot of creating, his kachot of producing for Torah and Mitzvot. I want to share with you guys a story. Beautiful, beautiful story. This happened a couple of weeks ago in Eretz Yisrael. A group of yeshiva bachim decided to go to vacation at Tzfat. They learn in the Mir, yeshiva Mir in Yerushalayim, and they decided to go to Tzfat for Airbnb. Okay. They sign a deal. They go Erev Shabbat on Friday. They drive all the way to Tzfat to the north. They go inside the house. Ay, ay, ay. Big flop, full of bugs. Mattresses are ripped. Bathroom hardly working. No air conditioning. And the boys are starting to complain. What do we do? We got uh, scammed. I don't know what's going on over here. We drove all the way here. Can you imagine spending Shabbat, boiling hot, no AC, bugs, this, that, the Shemir Achim. Maybe Israelis can handle it, but I would not be able to handle it. And the boys over Shabbat were discussing how they're not going to pay this person. They lied to us. We're not going to pay them for the Airbnb. Comes Matzah Shabbat, we're leaving. And then they discovered, you know who rented in the Airbnb? It was a lady over the phone the whole time. And this lady is a widow. She's an Almana. So the boys were saying, we're still not paying her. I mean, you know, we got scammed. She didn't tell us there's bugs, there's no air conditioning. She made it sound as if it's the best, uh, best apartment. One boy, one yeshiva bacha said, yeah, but she's an almana. She's a widow. She needs the money. 
So even though she's wrong, we have to be the famous shurat We have to be extra careful and make sure we give her the money. The other friends disagreed. He decided, this boy decided, this happened a couple weeks ago. He decided that he's going to pay from his own pocket. Now, Yeshiva Bacha doesn't have money, especially when you're in Israel. But he decided he's going to pay from his own pocket to make sure the almanac gets paid. His friends did not ship in. He will pay for everything. And he told his friends, to you be sheket, you be quiet, and don't tell this lady anything. Don't complain once. Okay, I'm going to pay full price. He doesn't have to pay for anything. That's what he did. Motzeh Shabbat, he went to the widow, this lady who was supposed to pay for the Airbnb, and he told her, thank you so much. Here is the money. We enjoyed it. And then he starts having a conversation with this lady, and she tells him, how old are you? She tells him, whatever, I'm 20-something. She tells him, are you in Shiduchim? Are you looking to get married? He says, yes, I am looking to get married. Okay, they exchange numbers. Baruch Hashem, that week, the widow calls up this boy, and she tells him, I might have the perfect girl for you. And they matched him up, Rabotai, and ran out this boy who said over the story. The way he said over, he's about to get engaged to this girl that this widow matched him up with. Listen to what happened here. At that time, the person, that boy, he had to make a decision. Should I give my own money or not? This Amana, this widow was wrong. But he made a good decision. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to create. I'm going to do a mitzvah. And he paid this lady. And because he paid this lady, besides the big mitzvah of making Amana a widow happy, look what happened. Ashgachah patit, Hashem matched the world. Ends up being, she finds him in Shiduch. It's an unbelievable thing. But what, is, what do we learn from that lesson? The opportunity that this boy had happens on a daily basis on a bigger scale or a smaller scale. We all have opportunities every day to create, to do mitzvot, to do the right thing, to overcome the yitzhara, to produce, to produce a better person. Another story was said over, and remind me to go back. This is a beautiful story. This person was said over from a guy from Bet Shemesh. This guy was an avrech, he was in Kolel. He has no money, but for many, 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 many years, he saved money every month. Him and his wife are very careful what to spend their money on in the groceries. And he put money, babank, as an investment, whatever it is, for years to come, to save money, to marry off his kids. His father, unfortunately, became very poor. And his father needed money for insurance, for different things. The son decided, this is not easy, the son decided to take a lot of the funds that he saved from his bank account to pay for his father for his father's uh, health, or whatever it is, for the insurance. It wasn't easy for him, but he did it. He went and he put the money down for his father's health. He said, Kibbut Av, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Wherever, I don't understand these things exactly, but he put his money in an investment in a certain type of bank, that that month, when he took out the money to pay for his father's insurance, that month, that bank collapsed. It went bankrupt. So all the people that invested the money in that bank account, everything is gone. You hear this? This is a big deal because it happens on a small scale almost every day. It wasn't an easy decision to take your money that you saved for so many years and give it to your father. You know how many excuses could come to your mind not to do it? But he overcame it. He used his kohot, his natural thing to create and produce and you become that good person. And he said, I'm going to do the right thing. Look how much he accomplished. He was zochet mikhein the mitzvah kibud avem. Besides that Hashem saved him the money. But the main thing is that he was able to produce and do a mitzvah kibud avem. Sarai Menu, the Torah tells us, she lived for 127 years. Now the Torah, every word, every letter in the Torah, there's a reason why it's written. And for some reason, when it comes to the life of Sarah, also did it by Ishmael, when it comes to the life of Sarah, they split up the years, 100 years, 20 years, and 7 years. The Pasuk, the verse was very, was very long. So Rashi, right away, brings out for the Midrash, why was the Torah ma'arich? Why did the Torah have to lengthen the whole verse, how old Sarah and many was when she passed away? Just say she was 127 years old. It doesn't say that. It says 100 years, and then 20 years, and then 7 years. Why did the Torah have to lengthen how old she was? So Rashi brings out to tell us, Kulan Shavin Letova. It was here to teach us a lesson. They're all of our 127 years of Sarai Menu. All of it was Shavin Letova. Was equally good every year of her life. Says the Ben Ishchai, an obvious question. Sarai Menu did not have an easy life. 
She didn't have a baby, a child. She, she, tell, she was 90 years old. She got basically got kidnapped twice. She got kidnapped twice, Sarai Menu. She had to deal with Hagal, this random woman in her house. Ishmael, or when the sons over there, was not behaving. She had a hard life. Sarai Menu did not have an easy life. So how can Rashi tell us, Kulan Shavina Tova, all of 127 years of Sarai Menu was equally good. It was not equally good. She had a lot of pain. She had a lot of tzarot. She had a lot of tragedies in her life. It was not an easy life. It was actually a very bumpy life. Says the Ben Ishchai, a beautiful answer. When a person lives with a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and his eyes always in the ball, I'm with the Kadosh Baruch Hu. No matter what that person goes through in life, Kulan Shavim Litova. And I'll give you a mashat. Imagine you have a wife who takes her toddler, her baby. She takes a one day, a, a one day's trip. She goes to Manhattan, and from Manhattan she goes to Brooklyn, and from Brooklyn she goes to North Jersey. She had a long day. She comes back home. Her husband tells her, "No, hon, how do you day go?" She tells, her, "Oh, today was a long day. I went to Brooklyn and Manhattan, and I took the bus all the way to Lakewood and came back. It was a long day, a lot of destinations." And then imagine the father goes to the little toddler, the Tinoch little baby, and he asks the baby, "New, no, how was your day?" All the baby knows is one thing. I was in my mother's arms the whole time. My mother's arm to the baby it doesn't make a difference. Manhattan, Brooklyn, Lakewood. I'm in my mother's arm the whole time. Sarah Imenu, no matter what she went through her life out of 127 years, no matter where she was and what she was going through, and it's a high level, but she knew she was always in Akadosh Baruch Hu's hands. She was always in Hashem, her father, God. She was always by Adam Shon Akadosh Baruch Hu. So no matter what she went through, Kulan Shavim Letova, they were all equally good. And Tehillim, we say in Halal, Evan Ma'asu Abonim Haita Lerosh Pina. Evan Ma'asu, which means, really means a rock. Ma'asu, that people despise. Like, let's say a not nice rock, a disgusting rock. Haita Lerosh Pina eventually will become or will be on top of the building, on top of the world. Why does David Melech have to use the word Evan, a rock? Why a rock? Evan ma'asu abanim, a rock that was despised, Aitali Rosh Pina will be on top of the mountain, will be the most shiny, the best rock, the best stone in the world. Why a rock specifically? The answer is a beautiful lesson. A rock, one of the main things in life, 99% of the time, a rock never stops being a rock. He always does his job. Whether it's a rock over here, whether it's a rock on top of the mountain, whether it's a rock on the floor, whether it's a rock in the kotel, a rock in the ocean with a seaweed on it, or a rock with sand in it, a chol, a rock is always a rock. An evan is always an evan. A stone is always a stone. So says David the Melech, Evan ma'asu abanim, which means a rock that people despise. An Evan that sometimes was going through hard times, but it always stuck to being an Evan. It was always a rock, never changed its position, never changed its job. Aitali Rosh Pina will eventually be on top of the world. Which means David the Melech, he wanted to say a, a big message, a big message. When a Jew is a Jew, no matter what he's going through in life, no matter what nisyanot and tests or surroundings he or she is in life if you're always going to do your job as a Jew and you're always going to behave like a Jew no matter what you know, test are thrown on a person if they're going to choose to do the right thing no matter where you are in life what age you are your surroundings your friends your family if you're going to do your job and always stick to being a Jew eventually you're going to get your, your reward you're going to get your olam haba you're going to be you're going to be on top of this world even ma'asua bonim a rock specifically because a rock never loses a job a rock is always a rock a Jew that will always be a Jew no matter where they are in the world what position they are eventually that is the Rosh Pina that is on top of the world a UD is always a UD never switches that was Sarai Menu Kulan Shavim Netova her whole years 127 years was all equally good but there's another understanding to this Rashi what does it mean Kulan Shavim Netova what it means is Rabotai the Sirai Amen. We can never choose what test one is you know, what Hashem gives us. We can't choose it. What we could choose is what to do with the test that Hashem gives in our way. We can't choose what test, what situation we're going to be in in life, what Hashem throws on us. What we could do is to know how to handle, how to react to the test that Hashem gives us. Over here, Sarah Emenu had many tests. 
But Sarai Menu, Kulan Shavin Tova, she always chose to do the right thing. She always chose to overcome the test and have Imunah and Akadosh Baruch Hu. We can choose what's going to come our way, but we can definitely choose how we're going to react to the situation to the test that Hashem brings our way. Are we going to scream Imunah? Are we going to say we have Bitachom in the hands of Akadosh Baruch Hu? Are we going to switch everything around and make it into Mitzvah? That was Sarai Menu. All of her 127 years, although she had hard times, Kulan Shavina Tova, they were all equally good because no matter what came her way, she knew how to flip it around and make it the mitzvah and choose good and do the right thing. I once met a guy in Deal. His business is, he showed me it, I went to his warehouse, he sells stuff on eBay and Amazon. This guy, Baruch Hashem, is a wealthy guy. So he took me to his warehouse and then he tells me, let me tell you what I sell. He opened up one of those huge crates, he opened up the door. And all I saw was junk. This broken piece, that broken piece, this broken laptop, screen, this, fans. I told him, what is this? He says, I'll tell you. I take secondhand things, and then I refurbish them, make them like look nice. And then when you put that on the, on the computer, on eBay, at the, everything is how you describe it, how professionally you look. And that's how this guy makes money. So I tell him, basically, you take junk, secondhand, and he turn it into gold. This guy's a wealthy guy. He makes money off people's junk. It's basically what he does. I thought to myself, every day, Hashem sends tests to a person. If you would sit at night quietly, quietly, and you take a pen and paper, and you try to write down what you went through that day, you'll be surprised how many opportunities we had that day to create and to be a better person. To choose good, just like Sarai Menu chose good her whole life. How many tests Hashem put you through that day? One person says the wrong comment, this guy bothers you, this was uncomfortable, you had a stomachache, this is, so many tests. But how does a person choose to react? That's their choice. If you take a pen and paper, you'll be surprised how much opportunities Hashem gives us that day to choose to do good like Sarai Menu. So it seems that Hashem is throwing junk at us, another test, more yisui, more pain, but our job is to be like that wealthy guy. Take the test, flip it around and turn it into gold. Turn it into mitzvot, choose good, do the right thing, scream in muna. Every time a person, every time Hashem sends a test to a person, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to grow and become a better person and get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that was Sarai Menu. Kulan Shavina Tova. Her whole life, she chose to do good. I, she had a hard life. She knew that when tests come her way, it's an opportunity to become a better person. Choose good. Let Tova. She chose good. She overcame the test. She had a Munana HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Sarai Menu recognized how much Torah and Mitzvot and how many opportunities we have in this world to turn into gold, to grab more Torah and more Mitzvot. You think coming to a class is a small thing, but it's a tremendous thing. To come listen to the Veta is a tremendous thing. How many, like I said this last time, how many Jews already are listening to the Veta? And it's one thing if a guy listens to the Veta on his phone in his house, but to drive to come to a class, that's a tircha. The Gemara tells us, Kol abali ta'er, whoever approaches to become holy, Mesa'in la Kadush Baruch Hu is going to help that person. Why does it call haba? Kol haba means whoever approaches. A person can't just sit and say, Hashem, please give me Torah Mitzvah, please make me religious. Hashem, please, it doesn't work like that. A person has to put in effort. So it says, Kol Haba, whoever puts it in effort, physical work, physical work for Torah Mitzvot, Mesayin La Hashem comes and boom and picks them up and brings them closer to Him. So people that come to that class is a big deal. There's tremendous, tremendous uh, reward. And besides the reward, Besides Olam Abba, there's no greater thing in the world than doing the right thing and making Hashem happy. You know, the highest level of a tzaddik, highest level of a righteous person, is a person that doesn't do Torah mitzvot for Olam Abba. Of course there's Olam Abba, of course there's a great reward. But what's the highest level of a Jew? A Jew who does Torah mitzvot for the sake of doing Torah mitzvot. And I'll give you a mashal for that, so much mashalim today. Chacham Avad Yosef, our great leader. Imagine... One of the greatest rabbis we had in generations. Imagine I got the opportunity. They call me up and they say, Yaakov, as Gabai calls me up, Yaakov, come to Chacham Avadi's house, a half hour, you be the guy that gets him all the sefarim, all the books that he needs. Oh, I'll run. I'll take a jet there. I come to Chacham Avadi's office, he tells me, Yaakov, give me a chumash. Yaakov, give me a gemara. Yaakov, give me a tosu, give me this. I'll be so excited to help Chacham Avadi yourself, the leader of the world. Imagine after that half hour, I go to Chacham Avadi and I tell Chacham Avadi, 200 bucks for the job. 200 bucks. That's disrespectful. Not only is it disrespectful to ask Chacham Avadi for $200, after you had the zechut, say thank you, even were invited. 
But if you're going to ask for $200, you don't recognize what you just did. You don't recognize, you just had the zikhut, the merit, to serve Chacham Ovadi Yosef. You know what that means? And you're asking for $200. Lahavdil Elif of the Lot. Hashem tells us, Jews, Jews, keep Shabbat, keep Shabbat. Then a person says, I'll keep Shabbat, but I want my Allah, Mabah. Eh. Say, thank you, you're able to keep Shabbat. You know what it means to keep Shabbat? You have the zikhut to serve God. Learn Torah, learn Torah, I'll learn Torah, Hashem only if you're making wealthy. Eh, what's going on over here? Say, think you even have the zikhut to learn Torah. You know what it means to learn Torah? You know what it means to keep Shabbat? We have the honor to even listen to Hashem. Is there a Lama Ba? Is there no Lama Ba? That's not the point. The point is now we have the zikhut to serve Hashem and there's no greater reward than serving a Kadosh Baruch Hu in this world. But Olam Hazed, there's so much to grab. Yes, there is an Olam Ba. There's no question there's a next world and a person will get reward for everything he does. But the focus is, I want to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the sake of serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's no greater honor than being a Yehudi, than being a Jew. Not only a Jew, a Jew that serves Hashem properly, keeping Shabbat, wow! No greater honor, no greater zikhut. There's nothing greater in life, nothing funner than grabbing more Torah mitzvot and more than that, being able to serve Hashem in this world. Thank you so much for listening. This should be the new Shabbat. My grandfather, Yosef Ben Avram, and all the names over here. Again, one time, Gita Devar Abat, Doiv Ber, and Mary Ben Batash Ami and Or Shraga Bazat Hashem Narod Mala Mala Began Eden Venomar Amen You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com